this talk, and it's a pretty short talk, um, I only have half an hour, is about the platform that we built, which is um, Integration Cloud. Um, I'm going to talk about the challenges we had, the things that you know we had to cope with, and especially why customers uh, choose for this. So, first of all, what is it? Well, actually, it's a managed services platform where customers can have you know, their integration fully outsourced. So we have integration projects running on this. It's built on the Azure platform. So they outsource their analysis, their development, their um, you know, monitoring and all these things to us. The only thing they have to do and the only thing they get out of it is reports and a monthly invoice. And as long as they keep on paying that, we will support them. So that's the whole thing. On top of that, it's not just an integration, let's say, platform as a service. No, it's also added value services. We talk about e-invoicing, especially uh, in Europe. It's a very hot topic where customers have to do, let's say, paperless invoicing. That's what we build on top of that. Next to that, of course, we have business reporting using tools like Power BI. Um, as I said, it's built on the Azure platform um, using a lot of the out-of-the-box components we have. Um, we focus on a self-service portal where customers can monitor things themselves, not using technical things, but using things they know. So if they want to search what's going on with an invoice, we will make sure they see the invoice number, the customer, and we try to hide the GUIs as long as we can, right? You have to drill down a lot of uh, times for that. It's built on Azure, and it's using BizTalk. It's using BizTalk services and BizTalk server, mostly for platform and EDI. I'm having a slide on the um, architecture later on, so you'll definitely see that. The different integration scenarios we focus on are hybrid integration, of course, where customers have data um, or applications all over the place, not only in one centralized data center, because it does make sense if you have five applications in your data center to have everything integrated through the cloud. That's only you know, adding latency and adding risk. It's mostly if you have different data centers that are not necessarily connected, that's the first scenario. Also, the B2B part, that's, let's say, the common uh, scenario, the most easy scenario to go um, to the cloud, because we're doing that for um, yeah, years already. Then the mobility and API is a very important one, and of course, SaaS, so software as a service integration, is key, as was uh, mentioned by um, Kent in this uh, talk this morning. So a little bit of history. We started on this thing in 2010, and that was the time that uh, Azure was still called Red Dog. We joined, back in those days, a lot of SDRs. SDRs is a software design review, and as, that's where I met those um, guys from Hyderabad um, coming to present their BizTalk services. So I remember the first time I saw them dragging those bridges that we um, have seen um, you know, in the past years. Um, and yeah, we were following that, but of course, what um, was the reality is that customers came to us and they wanted to have their integration in the cloud as soon as possible. We talked about 2011, so that's pretty early in the Azure um, timeframe. So there were no BizTalk services live at that point. Even virtual machines, the IaaS um, things were not existing, so we had the VM role to cope with a little bit of those things. Virtual networking like remote to on-prem was not there. So that's things that were missing and still we had customers live on the platform. And that's the main lesson that I'm going to talk. You can wait and you can keep on waiting until everything will be perfect in the cloud. Everything will be there 100% the way it should. But then you will have to wait for a long time. So we decided that we wanted to jump on the train as soon as we could, right? We also know that not every single customer is running on these things. We have the majority of our customers still running on this server in the data centers. And that will keep on changing, on going for a while, right? And that's what we want to have. We wanted to have in our offering everything from, let's say, everything outsourced till everything insourced for the customer. Quickly to the architecture, because it's a technical conference. Everything starts with um, the runtime. So we have worker roles um, in, in, in Azure. On the left, we have the portal. The portal is built in uh, HTML and AngularJS um, using Web API. So we have a Web API, everything you can do stopping, starting, deploying, everything is exposed through the API. So that's definitely something we could benefit from in France, where we built a custom portal fully for France for small um, customers. And yeah, that was a different team using that uh, API. So that's an important thing. Um, 
and everything is an API nowadays, right? The runtime is there, and a very important thing, if you want to make the analogy with Visto, we use service bus as the message box, right? So everything we do, every event we want to persist and do pops up on, is going through what we call the messaging topic. So we just publish on the topic, and you can create subscriptions in that portal on the fly. Then we have a watchdog topic, and that's mostly for instrumentation. So if you, as a customer, you say, I want to resume this message, yet we don't keep you waiting until everything happens. Now we just put that command on that queue, and it's all handles asynchronous, because that's the way you have to scale things in our opinion. So we have everything in the uh, runtime is through service. We have a lot of management threads listening on these topics. And then we have receivers, workflows, and, and transmitter threads. So they all have their, you know, if we have one receive endpoint, you can specify we have three or four threads listening there and hosting those types of, of adapters and so on. So messages coming in, they go to the um, web, webstock topic, and the management thread will say start listening on those um, endpoints and so on. And after that, if you have messages, every message is going from one component to the other over the service bus um, topic. I'm not going into all the details, of course. If you want to learn more, um, don't hesitate to contact us. On top of that, we have BizTalk Server, and we have BizTalk Services. So most of the runtime components are using workflow in this point, but we do quite a lot of things in BizTalk Services or BizTalk Server, and it's a switch. We can say this customer is running BizTalk Services. The other one is still having his um, processing um, in BizTalk Server in uh, Azure there. Uh, that's, for example, flat file parsing, EDI, and things like that, because we don't want to build that ourselves. So you see, SQL Azure is used for all these storage and things like that, um, but I'm not going into um, too much of details because of time. The challenges we have, and that's challenges that customers will have, and, and everyone who goes for cloud, um, is, for example, constant change. The platform is really in a constant change. And I had a talk with um, someone from Shell yesterday, and he, he said, we start to realize that indeed. And we start to know um, that you know, change will be more constant than it used to be before. You have to be able to cope with that. I mean, we saw things on service bus that you know, there's from ACS, you go to different uh, security <coughs> mechanisms. We built our own scheduler. And let's say a few months later, there was um, a scheduler service out of the box in Azure. So these things happen. Um, the biggest thing is that we took that change. We designed for that change, and our customers never noticed that because we provide that as a service. That's the, that's the main thing, um, the main added value there. A big challenge in cloud is definitely the multi-tenancy. So you have isolation. You don't want to have the data together and all of that. Um, we decided in the beginning that everyone should have their own you know, um, worker roles. But in the end, that, didn't, um, that wasn't um, for the smaller customers, it wasn't you know, um, priceable enough. So we went to a different change, and that's, that's a pretty complex thing we had to do. And then, of course, roadmap. It's important to see what a roadmap is, to keep an eye on things. If you see, oh, there's a scheduler coming, but maybe you just keep on waiting and you don't build your scheduler at that time. So that's important, keeping an eye on those things, um, making sure that you have the good contacts with community and with the um, product piece. And then another one is the disaster recovery planning. So it happens that um, some services are not available, or there's an outage somewhere, or things happen. And you, you probably have heard about um, such things. Building for disaster recovery is one thing, but testing the disaster recovery in a cloud-based solution, that's another thing. I mean, you can, you, uh, and that's what we do. We can say we, we disable system A, and we will do the full script to do system B. But if that script depends on something that is suddenly down in the Azure platform, like the command API and things like that, then, then it's becoming complex. And that's things that you cannot test and that you can only test in the real, um, let's say, outage situations. So that's definitely a pain point. And that's definitely something you have to you know, uh, learn um, the hard way. Now, what the customers want, it's not those things. They want to have the stability. They don't want to have the constant change. And that's what we provide. If you say to these customers, you can go to the cloud. If things change, if, for example, this log services might result into another thing called microservices, we will make sure that we will do the uh, migration and the alignment and whatever. We will just keep the business running and do um, the things for you. Most of these customers using that service, they don't care about the technology. They just want to you know, outsource it. They see us as a trusted partner. And of course, it's uh, SLA-backed. Um, Visibility, that's key. 
even if they trust that we run their business, they still have to get you know, an eye on things. They need to see where the invoice is. They need to see what happened here and there. And that's what we focused on uh, mostly. And they want to focus not on technology, as I said, but on services and solutions. And then the availability, that's of course, most of people see it as, yeah, they assume that the cloud is always there, but you have to really design for that, uh, for, you know, disaster. That's the things you have to um, understand. Now, just a quick demo that I'll be giving to show you the platform that we built, to show you how we um, build things and so on. So it's about e-invoicing. Um, so we re replace paper invoices in Europe by um, uh, you know, EDI or XML or PDF invoices. And that's becoming more and more uh, important. So what happens? I have set up an AS2 endpoint or an FTP endpoint. Both are um, listening there. And then we have a workflow. A workflow that will, firstly, an incoming invoice from a supplier, they will check it. They will see in a database, does this invoice is already, let's say, approved. Maybe there's the invoice number, the customer, or the supplier, and the amount. If that matches, they will say, we auto approve the invoice, and we just um, send it through um, further down the line. If we don't find a match, then it has to be approved manually. So that's a common scenario there. Um, after we do that check, we generate a PDF, because it's incoming EDI, but the customer doesn't want to read EDI in the SharePoint. No, he wants to see things like PDF or HTML. So we have the PDF generator component for that, and he will just create that PDF thing. In order to be you know, um, e-invoicing compliant, we also sometimes, especially if you send outbound um, PDF documents, you have to sign and timestamp them. For that, we use the other component. You will see they are just workflow activities that we use um, and that I use in my um, workflow. We will send these invoices to SharePoint Online, and the invoices that have been manually approved will be sent to my local machine here in this network through one of those services that um, Kent talked about, the relay binding. Okay? Let me now switch to the uh, actual demo to show things at work. So first of all, you have this portal. So you can log on to the portal with your credentials, active directory, whatever you want. And then you select your um, endpoints. And then it all starts with configuration. You can create your endpoints, like receive endpoints, transmit endpoints, and so on. And everything is based with what we call business activities. And you can compare them with your BizTalk applications. So here I have the invoice approval for my uh, demo. And let's zoom out. And you can see that I have um, a few endpoints there, the ones that I talked about, the AS2 endpoint, and the FTP endpoint. If I just double click, for example, this FTP one, you will see things that are uh, very familiar. We use the FTP type of adapter. We have specific properties like server, um, you know, all those uh, settings, passwords, and so on. And what we also can do, we can specify what we call a pre-routing step, something that's very similar to a pipeline. But in reality, it's a workflow that we execute on top of that message. You see some advanced things like um, do you want to check for matching subscriptions? Yes or no? Um, sometimes you just want to bypass that. You have failed message routing and things like that. So let me zoom out again. Um, and then show you what we built in Visual Studio. And this is just workflow. So you've probably seen workflow um, foundation before. So here I'm dragging and dropping um, things from the left side. And if you look there, you see a set of activities that we have built. Uh, people who know um, our products will probably recognize quite a lot of those um, activities because they are the same activities that we used to have in the BizTalk framework and that we actually have. So we have in BizTalk a pipeline component framework that's like 20 different pipeline components. And the good thing is that customers, if they want to migrate from BizTalk to this platform, it's just a matter of copy-pasting these configuration files to the new activities. So we reuse a lot of those things uh, from there. For example, what I'm doing here, we match the invoice, as I said, against the database. So for that, we have what we call the matrix tool. And if you um, click uh, see here, we say we will look up in this database, and it's an alias. So behind the scenes, we have a configuration or a connection string, sorry, um, for that um, endpoint. 
we look up in the invoices data uh, table, and we will say, we will match the messages. So the incoming, for example, X pops in the message from the invoice number will be matched against the column invoice number, and so on. So here I'm mapping values from my incoming message against my database, and I'm saying the result, the value that is in the column status, that result will be promoted to the context of that message. So in the end, after this, um, after this component is executed, I will know that I will have my message I will have an invoice match, yes or no. As you can see in the description there, you see, you read the property, invoice match. If we have a matching invoice, we will go uh, to the right and just mark the invoice as auto-approved, and otherwise we go to the left. So this workflow is just a workflow that I have uploaded through the deployment um, portal, where I just say here in the invoice approval, I have three active uh, workflows. So I can upload them, some are in memory, some have um, persistence capabilities um, possible. Just to show you um, the things that work, because we're limited in time, I will use my tool. And this is the most fancy tool that I can write. Um, and I actually started from an SDK sample from a uh, and software SDK. Um, so I added the car and the title, that's all. <laughs> Anyways, I will submit one message, a message that is matching. So this is an EDI. I mean, who knows the EDI, um, ED fact star? Poor people. Huh? Um, I always call it the Jason from the 80s. <laughs> that was compact, right? Anyway, if we just submit this message, I hope to get back, and that's what I see here, um, an MDN. So with AS2, an MDN is a legally binding thing. So if I do e-invoicing in Europe, it's pretty strict. You have to prove that the invoice that the customer has sent to you, that that invoice has not been tampered with. So we sign and decrypt and all of that on AS2. And the MDN is like the legally binding uh, act, the thing that you have to keep. So. Let me now go to the tracking and see what happened there. So this is the tracking portal. Here again I will switch to my invoice approval um, flow. You can see I automatically have some properties I can select. But let's just show um, everything that we have um, received. And if you click down a little bit, you can see I have an invoice. And this is what I meant with we don't show. And that's this GUID is just because the file is GUID. I mean, I cannot do anything about it. But we see the real, actual um, data. So we see the supplier, we see the invoice number, we see the total amount. That's what the customer wants to see. He doesn't want to see pipelines, he doesn't want to see all of those things. That's what he knows. If they have their business, that's what they you know, uh, want to search their messages for. And that's all about monitoring and tracking, in my opinion. If they then want to have a double click, a click through, we can see a replay of the flow. You can see that the message was received on AS2. In this, and you can click on the messages, so you can enable tracking. You can see that this message was received, and so on. The message was then translated to an XML. This happened on a local pistol, right? Using a, the EDI service there. Then we had the approval process, and we sent the message to the um, Office 365. So Office 365 um, was also just here. The um, the send port using some credentials towards our office thing. To show you that the message has arrived, I will press F5 on this document library. Ah, oh, that was probably the auto approved. So I had one that was auto approved because it was matching. Let me check in the tracking if that's indeed the case. So it's auto-approved, this one. So that's why it doesn't arrive. It doesn't arrive in my SharePoint because um, the only files that will arrive in SharePoint are the ones, or in that view, are the ones that have to be approved. So for that, let me pick this one. 
and submit the same file or the different file to the same endpoint. Clicking OK, I have the feedback here. And if we're quick enough, we might actually see the flow stepping through, but the flow is finished already. So the message should be uh, on that, um, yeah, and that's where it is. If I click here, what we will see is that I have a PDF. So from that, um, from that incoming EDI, I went to XML. I changed that to XSLFO. That's another standard HTML-like for PDF. And then we created this PDF thing. As you can see, the PDF has been signed as well. Although in this browser it's not really visible. Ah, there it is. It's signed, and I can see the signature properties. It's signed with a self-signed certificate. And that's why I have the exclamation thing. But that's, that's the things that customers want to see, right? Um, if I go back and I say, I will now approve this invoice. And for that, I do the edit properties. I can say, OK, let's approve this one, and click Save. What I also have, but I have disabled the port, just to show you, is a receiver for those approved invoices. And it's using, HTTP, uh, it's using um, Office 365 as well. So if I now go to the, to the monitoring settings, you will see that that port at this point is stopped just to show you how it works. So the handled invoice, as you can see, is stopped. So I will just, there it goes, start this one. And in reality, I'm expecting a file on my local computer, the PDF file that was um, approved in the cloud. I'm expecting that file to arrive in a few seconds. I think it is, it's there. If I open it, you will see it's the exact same PDF one that I have created. Now, just to show you, how did I connect from that cloud, from this cloud platform in Azure, it's in Dublin, to this machine in a guest network of Microsoft behind a few firewalls and things like that? But for that, we used Relay services, the, the Azure Service Bus Relay capabilities, with a tool that we have, the Coded Cloud Connector. So if I select here, you can see I'm selecting one of the four connectors that I have enabled. On my local computer, and I'm still zoomed in, I guess, I have called it Cloud Connector. So this is just a service we give with the platform. It's installed. And from the cloud, I'm able to manage and to see the logging of that local Cloud Connector. I can see the details here. I can see. What all what, what happened? I can see the settings for my um, client here, where he's listening on a file and sending to a file and so on. So I can stop and start these things. So he's using Service Bus Relay, an endpoint exposed to this platform, and from that platform we are submitting the file to the relay, and locally he's writing it to the configured channel. In this case, it was just to the file. Now to end. I have two things left, two things that, uh, because everything I've shown until now is mostly used by people in our company, people who are using um, and managing the platform, who are developing. What customers will use, that's the e-document thing. And this is built, and it's also because of a requirement, if they have an audit, like a legal audit for um, financial reasons, um, they need to show that they're e-invoices have been sent and so on. So if I click here, I should be able to see the recent invoices. And this is, for example, the invoice that they have. This is what a financial guy knows. He doesn't know EDI, except maybe a few exceptional ones. Um, but they still can see the actual file that was sent. And also the, the act, the legally binding thing, is there. So this contains the real act that has been signed and approved and the thing that is, is used by the um, other people. And to really finish, I also used Power BI on that tracking data for reports. And actually, I didn't build this. It's uh, our CEO who built it. So it really shows that business people can um, have you know, 
um, capabilities to build things. Um, but he used to do pistol server back in the days, so he still has the um, rules. As you can see, everything is um, automatically, you know, contextual. So I click on um, the customer Microsoft, and I see where he has sent the invoices, uh, and so on. Just an example to, you know, that technical data that is in your database, you can give that to your customers. That's where you can start building things. And I want to be right on time. By also making the link with the microservices, because I also, the first thing that I wanted to do, looking at um, the those announcement of microservices was, hey, what, what does that mean for us? What do we have to do? And then I reminded back, uh, I, I told back about a uh, conversation I had with our lead um, developer, Rotor in Belgium. He came, I believe, in February this year. He said, I think we have to do something. I, I read about microservices, so just a concept, not about because Microsoft probably didn't even <laughs> thought about that. He said, I think we have to build it in a microservices, um, let's say, manner. And we did some refactoring, and we had, instead of doing HTTP calls and so on, we have service bus, but everything that we had in the platform was built as a microservice. So I'm very happy to see what's going on at um, you know, the, the announcements. So I'm pretty sure that we will be easily, uh, that it's, it will be probably rather easy to move our things on that new platform and to just focus on the added value that I talked about. So the end goal is really that we want to provide the abstraction for the customers. They shouldn't care about the technology. They shouldn't care too much about all the changes, at least the integration as a service customers. Um, and we want to provide that abstraction, okay? With that, I'd like to thank you because time is um, important. And, uh, if you have questions, don't hesitate to contact me.